Hi everyone, it's David. And uh, some of you are finding this uh, video of me today, right now, in the late, late afternoon on Sunday because you received an email. Some of you are just discovering this and are curious about what story I'm going to tell. Well, I, I wanted to tell you a little bit first about the day before I tell the story because it actually is remarkable how much the day and the story have in common. So our new website has been launched and it's beautiful and wonderful and does so much of what we had always dreamed of. Um, the process though of launching it has created a few problems and they're all being fixed, but it takes time. And I, uh, I, saw, I saw one of you, a sparkler, a couple days ago, he came up to me, a little five-year-old boy, and he said, hey, what's up with the site? And it was very true. You see, his family was one of the, the few families that were having trouble getting in. And, you know, there's a place that you want to go to, a special land maybe, sparkle land. You want to get in, and there's an entrance to get in. But the person at the door um, has just been hired, and doesn't know who you are and we're inside waiting for you we can't wait to see you and and the person at the door says i'm sorry you you, you can't come in i don't recognize you and when we heard about this especially this morning when so many of you actually were being turned away because of a, a simple problem that is now fixed it kind of hurt it kind of hurt inside to think that you were being turned away from coming and joining us inside where we could be with you and it was like the door was locked and our friends, you, couldn't come in. And so we, we struggled with that. that. That didn't feel good. That didn't feel good. And so then Lisbeth went on a walk with our dogs and uh, in a wooded place, a beautiful place, and she suddenly had this idea. It was like the, the trees whispered to her, there's, there's another way. And it's so true. There's always another way when there's love. And we love you. We love you. We don't want to be separated from you. We want you to have what we have to offer and vice versa. So love was there and it provided another way. And so until every single one of these little glitches, these, these curious folk that are standing at the door and saying, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you, until we really make sure that they know that you are welcome in, I'm going to just tell you stories here. And we have another way to do the audio stories um, via SoundCloud. And your, your parents or your grandparents or your older friends will, will know what that means. Um, but you can also come here, and I'm going to keep telling stories for a while until we feel like it's been worked out. And that at least makes us feel good that we're reaching out and you can find us in another route. So I think that's all I'll say for now. And uh, um, come back again tomorrow and I'll, I'll tell another story. And maybe we'll send out another email uh, to those of you who are on our list so that you can tell when, when that story will be coming out. Maybe we can even do it live. I think that can happen. Um, and, uh, and you can hear the next story. So this story is called The Cooper and the Winter Oak. Yes, some of you know this story. Um, now, when I tell a story in the moment, because I, so many stories have moved through me, I, it's going to be different. It's going to be um, in its heart the same story, but the way in which I tell it will be different. Parts of it will be left out from the audio version and uh, new parts will suddenly find their way in. So you're going to hear two versions of the story if you listen to this and then if you listen to the... Uh, um, to the audio story that's, that's on our, our website, if you stream it there. It's called The Cooper and the Winter Oak. And it is, well, it's about a cooper. And for those of you who don't know what a cooper is, it's a barrel maker. Now, long ago, many things were stored in barrels. That was actually a very popular way to store um, drink and food and materials, dry goods, all sorts of things 
were put in barrels. They were easy to transport onto carriages and to take from place to place, but they needed to be made well. And this uh, cooper, this barrel maker that the story is about, was a very good cooper. He knew all about how to make the right barrel for whatever it was storing. So the way in which a barrel is made is there are these staves of wood, these pieces of wood that are fit together and held in place with these metal hoops. And the hoops have to be the right size and the staves have to be the right size and the headboard has to be the right size on both sides. And uh, um, they not only need to fit properly, but depending on what it is that they're storing, it needs to be the right wood. Because wood expands and contracts uh, differently and it has, if it's food, the wood itself will affect the taste, especially with drink. And so um, this Cooper was excellent, excellent at uh, knowing exactly the right kind of wood for what was going to be inside. So he, he had a lot of work. Now, his workshop was actually outside of town. It was up a hill, and it was up on a wide open plain. Now that wide open plain used to be covered in trees, but over years and years and years of people cutting down the trees for firewood and for building homes, and then to open up the land for sheep, there were very few trees in that area. And so when the cooper, when the barrel maker was younger, he would go off into the woods, especially to the north, where there were a variety of different trees, and he would cut down the tree that he needed for that particular wood, if it needed to be an oak, or if it needed to be a maple, or if it needed to be a beech, or an ash, or even a cedar. He would cut it down and uh, um, chop it up. It would take some time. And then, oh, surprise, and, uh, and then he would carry it back in with a carriage, his horse-drawn carriage, back to his workshop, and he would cut it, oh, ding, another, another surprise, and he would cut it into pieces, and, um, and then cut those down into quarters and, and eighths, and then into small staves, and he would store them for when he needed them. Well, he was an old man for this story, this part of the story. He was still the best barrel maker around, um, but he couldn't go off into the woods to get the wood like he used to. He didn't have his horse anymore. He didn't have his carriage. It was just him in his workshop. And so from time to time, he would go into town and he would hire a woodcutter to go into the woods and find exactly the tree, the kind of wood that he needed would go and they would fetch it and bring it back. Well this worked very well and he was able to um, um, always get his orders done on time. He was a man of his word. It was very very important for him to follow through with what he said he was going to do. If he said it would be done um, by May 8th, it was done by May 8th um, and it was done properly and it was done well. He had that reputation. Well, there was a, a winemaker in town that made a certain kind of wine. And this winemaker wanted the wine to be stored in a very particular tree. And the challenge was it was a rare tree. It was called a winter white oak. It had a very particular taste to the wood, and it affected the wine, and that's what he wanted. It was hard to find these trees. And so he put in a very big order to the cooper to find, um, to get the wood from a winter white oak tree and make the barrels from that. Well, luckily, the cooper did actually have enough winter white oak staves to fulfill the order and to do it on time. The challenge was that um, winter came early. Um, he needed to have the order done by Christmas and uh, um, toward the right toward the tail end of fall, right as it was about to turn winter, a storm came in, and he was working tirelessly on these barrels to get them ready, fitting them to size. And the winds came, and the first snows came, and he thought, I, I need to go into town because I don't have enough wood to heat my home in case this is a bad storm. He was always very prepared. And so he worked on, he finished the barrel that he was working on, 
and uh, fit the, the, the metal rings on. When he was finished with that and put the headboard in place, he went outside to go into town to see that he could purchase some more firewood. But the snow had picked up, and he knew that he wouldn't make it in town, make it to town that, that day or that evening. So he stayed where he was, and he used the pine wood to heat his home. Well, this went on for a few days. The snow got heavier and heavier and deeper and deeper, and it got colder and colder. So he had to be very careful how much wood he was using. But he had to keep feeding the fire in order to keep his workshop warm enough so that he could work. And at night, he would let it get very cold, and he would pile underneath many layers of quilts and blankets, and he was cold. He was very cold. But it was more important for him to follow through with his word, to honor his word, and to get the order done in time than it was for him to be comfortable. That's the kind of person the Cooper was. But after a while, he's, his firewood supply began to dwindle less and less, went through the pine, started burning the ash. When the ash was gone, the beach. And then he could see that he was actually down to his last few logs. Well, it wasn't the last wood in his workshop. He still had the staves of the, the winter oak. He could use them, but he wouldn't. It was more important for him to get the job done to honor his word than it was for him to be warm at all. He would rather risk his safety. So the situation was actually quite desperate. It was very cold, the snow was thick, the storm was still going, and he was faced with a decision. Well, his situation was actually known to someone else. It wasn't a person. It was to a nature spirit, a fairy. There was an elf that was nearby. It was residing in a tree, the only tree uh, that was anywhere near his workshop. In fact, it was right outside of his workshop. And that elf was very much aware of what was going on for the Cooper. And that elf was very invested in the Cooper. And that elf wanted to help. And she could. You see, elves, fairies, sprites, pixies, gnomes, nymphs, they tend the natural world. They care for the natural world. They're little beings of, of energy and support. And they're helpers. And sometimes when they develop a relationship with a person, they will help a person as well. And this elf knew the Cooper very well. You see, that tree that she was tending that tree that was so special to her was also special to the Cooper. And the elf knew that. And that meant a lot to the elf. You see, that tree that was outside the workshop was, in fact, a winter white oak. And she was a winter white oak elf. She had known the Cooper her whole life. And he had always sensed a presence and a um, an affection that was that he attributed to the tree. It was like the tree itself was his family. He had grown up with that tree, grown, grown up climbing in that tree. His father was a cooper and his grandfather was a cooper who had built that workshop. And so he grew up with this tree, playing in it and climbing and swinging in a rope swing that was there. And so this... Uh, this winter white oak fairy, this elf, knew the Cooper very well and knew that he was strong, he was enduring, he was a man of his word, and he was true, kind of like an oak tree. And so that night, where things got rather desperate for the Cooper, she decided she would help. So she went to the top of the tree, very top branch, as the wind was whistling around and the snow was whirling around her and she whispered out 
into the night because it was now nighttime, and she whispered out that the Cooper needed some help. Well, the whisper changed as it went through the plains and then into the forest to the north, and it actually found the ears of someone who could help and also needed help. It was someone that was very well known to the fairy world. It was a woodcutter, a gentle woodcutter, who was a, a sensitive man, had always been sensitive. He could hear things that others couldn't. He could feel things that others couldn't. And he respected the natural world in a way that the fairy life also respected. Before he cut down a tree, he talked to the tree. He asked for its permission to be cut down. And when he received it, when he felt it, when he heard it, he would then cut down the tree. And so it was this woodcutter that was now actually in need of support himself. He had been going through with his sleigh, cutting trees and making them into logs. They were in his sleigh and he was pulling the sleigh himself through this now thick pack of snow. And it was getting late and he was cold and he needed a place to sleep. So he whispered out into the night, I need a place to sleep. And these two whispers, one from the winter white oak elf and one from him met and, and found each other. And uh, he heard an answer to his, to his question, to his desire, to his wish, and it said, follow me. So he did. He pulled the sleigh, followed the sound, followed his heart, his affection, and it led him through the woods all the way to an open space where at the end of it he could see a cabin. There was a little thin wisp of smoke coming out. That was where he needed to go. So when he reached there, he knocked on the door and he was very cold by now, and the cooper, of course, went straight to the door, opened it. Some snow came in, and the wind whirled through, and he brought the cooper inside, covered him in quilts, and said, Oh, my word, you, you, you're so cold. Let me put some fuel in the fire. And then he proceeded to put the last few beech logs in there. He heated up some stew and gave it to the woodcutter, the woodcutter was very grateful as he ate the stew and warmed himself, and the cooper apologized for how chilly it was inside because he had very little wood. But uh, um, then he looked over at the winter white, oak, winter white oak staves that were supposed to be for the barrel making, and he knew what he needed to do. When the beach logs were burned through, he went over to the winter white oak staves, got a pile, and went over to his fire to feed the fire. See, he wouldn't do it for himself, but for a guest, of course. He was about to put it into the fire when the woodcutter said, wait, I'm no tradesman, but I can see that that wood was not meant to burn. Please, you've, you've saved me tonight. Let me give you something in return. He took off the quilts and he went outside, closed the door, and a few moments later the door opened again and he began to throw in log after log, maple, hickory, ash, more beech, log after log until the firewood pile grew up, 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 and up until it reached the ceiling of his workshop. There was so much wood there. And he came inside, and the cooper insisted that he pay the woodcutter for this wood, but the woodcutter said, no. Keeping me from freezing and giving me something to eat is certainly worth a pile of wood. So they stayed up late, talking about their lives, their lives alone. They spent so much time alone that they found that they had a lot in common and they spoke and they talked and they enjoyed each other's company so much by the roaring fire, the warm, warm fire. And 
The woodcutter spent the night, slept soundly, and in the morning said thank you to the cooper, and the cooper held the woodcutter's hand and said thank you, both feeling that they had received a great, great gift. And so, as the woodcutter left and the cooper said goodbye, and he started pulling his sled down to the edge of the hill that led into the town below, he paused for a moment because he heard something, and it was the words, Thank you. And he turned around, and what saw him surprised him. There was the, the workshop with a nice, thick smoke coming out of the chimney. You could see shadows of the cooper working inside. But what really caught his attention, what impressed him most, was the tree. The winter white oak tree that had grown in such a way that it looked like two huge, strong arms were wrapping themselves around the workshop like a mother embracing her child. And this made the cooper, this made the woodcutter feel warm inside in a very special way. He nodded his head to the tree and turned and headed down the hill toward the town. That was nice. Thank you all for being here. And I'd like to tell another story tomorrow. I'm not sure which one now, but uh, I look forward to seeing you. <laughs>